This analysis guide is going to show you how to do a simple regression as well as a multiple regression in SPSS. So the data set is available to you is open here. It's a very simple data set in which we've got in total 72 participants who completed some different questionnaires. We've got participants age and years, the gender, and you can see that I've coded females as zero, males as one. Um, and we've got a body mass index. You will note that body mass index does seem quite unusual as scores. You know, an average body mass index, an average weight should be between 20 and 25 or so. And you see these numbers are really, really small. This is because um, in this data set, body mass index didn't have a normal distribution. So therefore, I conducted what's called a log transformation on the data, which is basically a procedure that you can use to make non-normally distributed data normally distributed and to enable you to conduct regression analyses on this variable. So this, this variable here, BMI, is going to be our dependent variable in our analysis. And it has normal distribution following the log transformation I conducted on it. The other variables are anxious attachment, which is a score on a questionnaire assessing whether individuals have problems with attachments and these specific attachment problems are anxiety related and a parent skill score so retrospective questionnaire which we got mean score from the items in this questionnaire in which we asked um, our participants about parents and skills that parents have particularly in regard to feeding the children and so on so what we are interested in this data set. We can ignore age and gender here. In the next video, we're going to look at those two in more detail. What we're interested here is whether anxious attachments predicts body mass index of our participants. And it's assumed or predicted that participants with higher anxious attachments will have a greater body mass index, possibly because they use food as a coping mechanism to deal with these anxious attachment issues that they have and higher parental skill scores should be associated with lower BMI. This is hypothesized to be the case because of the belief that if you grow up with your parents feeding you more healthy foods and so on that you're going to bring that into your adult life yourself. So participants who had parents who fed them worse, gave them lots of sweets, um, fed them at irregular times and so on, gave them any food that was requested. We predict that this could carry on into later life and those individuals who had low perceived parent skill scores should have higher BMI. What we're going to do is first just do a simple regression analysis just to take you through that as a procedure in which we're going to see if anxious attachment predicts BMI in our participants. So running a simple regression analysis is really straightforward in SPSS. We just need to go to analyze and then regression and we want linear so this is a standard general linear model then we've got our dependent variable and then our independent variables to list so our dependent variable is body mass index we just click that across there and our independent variable we're only going to look at one of the moments is anxious attachment skill so we click that in there you'll see here it says method enter this is the standard method of putting your independent variables into a regression analysis. You'll see the stepwise, remove, backward, forward, and so on. Personally, I would rec never recommend using really any of those other things. They all involve making certain assumptions about your data, or it's just very hard to get statistical justification for using these other methods because they're quite arbitrary. So an enter method is basically, I predict this thing is going to predict our dependent variable. So you just put it in, there's no sort of rules about whether you keep it in, whether it goes in, etc. It just is there in your data. You will probably never use any other method other than this, and generally I'd recommend against using them in any circumstance. So now we've got all these different things here, we've got different statistics. We could ask for some confidence intervals, for example. We, can have, we could ask for our descriptive statistics, so this will give us some means and standard deviations. These factors here, we're not going to worry about within this video at the moment, nor will we worry about this video, or these factors here. So we just click continue. 
there's different options, stopping, stepping method for criteria. We don't need to look at any of these factors. That's basically all we really need to do for a simple regression. So we click OK, and this gives us our output. And you can see we have got our mean and standard deviation for BMI, a mean and standard deviation for anxious attachment score. So that's just our simple descriptive statistics. It also gives you a correlation matrix as well as part of the descriptive statistic as part of the regression analysis. We don't really need this. It's not that particularly important to us at the moment, but I will point something out about it later on. So the first table we'll see here, it says variables entered removed, and this is simply the setup of your regression model. So it says here model one. When you do a regression in this style, you're only ever going to have one model. It only becomes, you only see different models, model one, and then another box of model two, if you do what's called a hierarchical regression, which I'll be showing you in a later video. In this case here, it simply states variables entered, variables removed, and the method. So in this case, we've just got variables entered and this attachment score. The methods I show you, this will never be populated. And the method is the enter method, which is what I highlighted before. And again, that's the one you should really be using. So this just tells you how you've set things up. And it says here as well, your dependent variable is BMI. So you just know you've set things up correctly in your regression analysis. This next table is a very important table when it comes to regression analysis. You'll see it gives you an R, an R squared statistic, an adjusted R squared statistic, and a standard error of the estimates. This value here, this R, is essentially the Pearson's R from the correlation coefficients. And you'll note that that is exactly the same as the one that's given to you in the correlation table. It's just the correlation coefficients. Now, these two values are important. We've got R squared and adjusted R squared. They're used relatively interchangeably. Personally, I prefer the use of adjusted R squared because it's a more conservative measure. And as you can see, we've got our R squared statistic here as 0.218 and our adjusted R squared 0.207, so it's slightly smaller. Generally speaking, I think it's always wise to be quite conservative of when you're reporting any statistics. Um, so in this case, we're just gonna look at the adjusted R squared. And um, we can ignore the standard error of the estimates as well. Basically, what we can use this, this gives us a rough estimate of the amount of variance that our regression model predicts. So you can simply just convert this into a percentage. So as it's 0 0.207, to convert this into percentage, we just move our decimal place over three points, it times it by 100. And what you can see is this gives us a 20.7% of variance and you can write this up accordingly so you could say that the regression the regression model predicted approximately you'd round this up 21% of variance in BMI so however it's all very well saying oh we predicted this percentage of variance but is that amount of variance statistically significant and this is where our ANOVA table comes in Regressions and ANOVAs are completely related to each other, well, um, ultimately the same mathematical theory behind it. And what we need to do is simply, we look at this, okay, it predicts approximately 21% of variance, and this says that amount of variance is statistically significant. You'll notice it doesn't give us an effect size, so like you'd be familiar with from previous ANOVA videos, the partial letter squared. This is because it doesn't really need one, because you're actually really clearly articulating how big an effect is. It's predicting about 21% of variance. So the first step in the regression is simply you would write up these two tables combined and it just look like such. So basically, you'd be saying the regression model predicted approximately 21% of variance in BMI scores, and we can report our adjusted R squared, and then we'd report the ANOVA in exactly the way that you're familiar with. You'd give it an F degrees of freedom and its p-value. So the reader now knows that you're predicting about 21% of variance and that's statistically significant. The next thing we need to look at is this. This is the coefficients table. With a simple regression, this doesn't give us that much additional information, really. Because it's a simple regression, this is simply going to say 
This is the association between anxious attachment score and BMI. Because we've only got one predictor, and we know it's statistically significant, therefore, this number is also going to be statistically significant, and it's inherently going to give you the same p-value. So we'd still write this up, because this does actually give us one additional piece of information. This tells us the direction of the association between anxious attachment scores and BMI. And the regression coefficients tell us this. Because the regression coefficients, so if you look at the unstandardized one here, or we look at the standardized one here, because these are positive numbers, i.e. they don't have a minus figure in front of them, that means there's a, a positive relationship between anxious attachment scores and BMI, i.e. as anxious attachment increases, so does BMI. And you would report this as well. Now, when you're writing this up, you can report it as an unstandardized regression coefficient, which is written as a capital B, and it's standard error. You must report a standard error if you give an unstandardized regression coefficient. That is critical. On its own, this doesn't have very much value. Or you can report the beta value instead, which is a standardized regression coefficient. Generally speaking, you see both in the literature. Sometimes you see both together, which I think is a somewhat wasted. Um, generally speaking, I would argue that the standardized regression coefficient is a slightly more useful statistic. Because it's standardized, it means if you're doing a multiple regression, as we'll see later, you can compare which are the greater predictor, which is the best predictor. Simply put, the greater the beta value, so the higher the beta value, or the further away it is from zero, because it can still be a high value but a minus value, the stronger the predictor is. With, if you were to try and do that from looking at these two figures, you need to interpret the two of the things together. So we could write this up and we can mention the direction of this relationship. We can say there's a strong positive association between anxious attachment and BMI. You can repeat that p-value as well if you want. You can get marked down for such a thing and it's very commonly reported. So that's your very simple regression analysis and you've probably done one of these before, but that covers the real basics of it. So what happens in a multiple regression? How do things change? So if we go back and run our linear regression, what we can do is we can add our other independent variable here below. So now that we've so now we've got a regression model that has got anxious attachments as a predictor and parent skill score as a predictor of BMI. Again, we're not going to look at any of the other things. We're not going to look at collinearity diagnostics and things like that yet. I'll cover that in a later video. So we want to see if these two things predict BMI. So what actually our regression analysis here is going to do is going to tell us first of all whether together our model predicts how much variance in BMI it predicts and then it will also give us how strong a predictor this variable is and how strong a predictor this variable is and whether these predictors are significant. So to do this multiple regression, simple multiple regression, we just simply add another variable in here and we click OK. So now you can see we've got some more means and standard deviations and now we've got another correlation added, correlation between BMI and parent sales score. So we see our variables entered and removed, you see we've got model one, we've only got model one because when we ran it we put them both into this single box here. If we put them into separate boxes later on then that would give us two models. So the variables entered, parent sales score and anxious attachment score method was enter, no variables were moved due to the enter method being used and our dependent variables BMI. So now it gives us another model summary. So you can see we've got R square and we've got some adjusted R square and our standard deviation mode. We can ignore that and we can also ignore that. So as you can see here if you look at our R squared of 0.221 and we compare that to our previous one it's gone slightly up, 0.218, almost negligible, 
very small increase in the proportion of variance that's been explained. If you look at our adjusted R squared, you can see this figure's actually gone down. Adjusted R squared punishes the R squared value for the, the, the more predictors it gets. So this is why I say this is a more conservative measure because you're being slightly more conservative because you're, you're taking into account you've got more variables in your, in your regression model and it removes some of the variance explained due to for that reason. So you can see here this has gone slightly down. So from that you can pretty much be certain that our parent sill score is not going to be a very good predictor because if it was a good predictor we'd see this would get much bigger. If this was as good a predictor as our anxious attachments it would predict. So let's say 40% of variance as previously it predicted about 20% of variance. So what we do here is simply we write this up overall the regression model, the regression model being these two variables predicting BMI predicted approximately round that up which would be approximately 20% of variance. If you look at our an over here you can see it's still statistically significant. We are still showing the statistically significant effect because 20% of variance is still quite a lot to predict and we'd write that up accordingly. Of course now you see this only really tells us the amount of variance that our two variables predict. It doesn't tell us well which variable is predicting more variance than the other one. So, you know, if we were to run this, we didn't do our simple regression first. There's no reason why you should, other than to illustrate something in this example. So if we were just to run this and put our two variables in, we'd go, oh, we're predicting 20% of variance. However, what this doesn't tell us, it tells us the model is significant and it predicts a decent amount of variance, but it's not telling us which of the two things are a significant predictor. And this is where the coefficients table becomes very important. So we sim simply write this up and we say the regression model predicted approximately 20% of variance in BMI scores. We report our adjusted R squared, our F value along with this degrees of freedom and its P value. And then we need to interpret the coefficients table. This is a relatively straightforward procedure to look at. So as I say, I tend to recommend looking at the beta values. I think they're much more easy to interpret. So what we can look at is anxious attachment score, as you can see, as before, significant amount of variance is explained, and it's a positive relationship. As anxious attachment increases, there's a significant increase in BMI in our participants. However, if you look at parent sales score, you can see there is a negative association and it's not statistically significant. So this is basically telling us though our overall regression model is significant, predicts 20% of variance, only one of our predictors has any value, anxious attachment score. There is a strong significance association between anxious attachments and BMI. However, there is no statistically significant association between parent skill score and BMI. So as I say, you can write this up like this. Of course, you could report the beats from the standard error instead. Writing it up would look like this. There is something else though that is very commonly done and really should be done a key assumption check, which is in a regression analysis. And that is the problem of multicollinearity. What multicollinearity means is basically these variables, for example, are really highly correlated. That causes problems with the regression model. It destabilizes your regression coefficients. So what this means is it basically just gives you unreliable regression coefficients. And you don't want to be writing up results always significantly so we show significant support for our hypothesis when in fact you haven't shown anything. It's just merely a product of you violating this assumption. It's, it's a really, really easy thing to check. If we go to regression, we go to linear, and do statistics, we can ask, we can tick this box here, collinearity diagnostics, and then click continue, then click OK. What this essentially does is give you this extra little bit on this table here, which is what we're interested in. And this is the one we're particularly interested in. This is the variance inflation factor. Basically, this is the thing that tells us if we have a problem with multicollinearity. Essentially, there's lots of different cutoffs for this for being a problem. I've seen some recommendations that if this value is greater than 10, it's a problem. However, I think that is far too lax, and I'd say 
you have a variance inflation factor of three or more, then you've probably got a problem with multicollinearity. As you can see in this case, there's no problem with multicollinearity, so it's not something we need to be concerned about here. And again, with things like multicollinearity, violation of assumptions, you only would report them and do something about it if it's a problem. In this case, it's not a problem. If you do have a problem with multicollinearity, it's not that much you can really do. There's no sort of neat statistical way around it other than a very complicated method. One thing you can do is if the two variables are highly correlated with each other, well, you probably only need one of them in your regression equation because they're both essentially measuring the same thing. That's one thing you could do. So you could just remove one of the variables if they're really highly correlated. Alternatively, you could convert your variables to z-scores. So you'd standardize them, then you could add them together and have a sort of amalgamated variable that covers both these two variables together. The actual statistical solution to it, which is very rarely used and rarely talked about, is to put what's called a ridge correction on it, do a ridge regression. This basically corrects your regression coefficients due to multicollinearity. I'm not going to cover ridge regressions here because it's beyond the scope of any undergraduate study, but if anyone's interested in ridge regression, they'll be happy to send them some papers that discuss them in some way, or I will post some online.